So, good morning, everyone. We find in the counting of the Omer that um, it says it's seven weeks, but it also says it's Miyamokhrat Shabbat, and it says <coughs> Shabbat. Sheva Shabbatot Mimotiena. They should all be perfect Shabbatot. The same also in the counting of the Schmidt and the Omer. The Lord says Sheva should be seven years. Sheva Shanim. Then it says Sheva Shabbatot Shanim. So what's the meaning? The Shabbat is can be used for the day of the Shabbat and can be used for the whole week. And the counting is seven weeks. Of course, every week contains a Shabbat. Why is it emphasized by the counting? I think for this, the best explanation is as follows. The Gemara says, <coughs> Shavuos is the end of the seven weeks. <coughs> the, there's a Shemitah series of seven weeks, and then there's seven Shemitahs lead to the Jubilee, which is, as we already explained, is a parable. At the given the Torah on Shavuos, it says, Mishach HaYover, it's also called the Jubilee. We also find the 50th year in the land of Israel is also called the Yover, which we spoke about in the previous Shi'ulim. So to understand this, and also understand why when, it, when we know Mokhrat HaShabbat means not Mokhrat HaShabbat, means Mokhrat HaPesach, means the second night of Pesach, and not the second night of the Shabbat. So why is it then called the Shabbat? It's just the Yom Tov, the Yom Tov called the Shabbat. So the answer to all, the deepest answer to all this is as follows. And it can be based on the brilliant essay of the Ramban at the end of Pasha's book, where he speaks about Hashem is Barach with regard to the people of Israel and the land of Israel. There are two types of Hanagot, two types whereby he leads the people of Israel and the land of Israel. One is to open miracles. No question. The redemption of the people of Israel is through open miracles. In the desert, open miracles. When they came to the land of Israel, open miracles. Many. But he says the purpose of open miracles is to get us to understand that all of nature, the natural things that happen without miracles, is a hidden miracle. So we, she mentioned, described already before. It's a hidden miracle that also leads us to an awareness of God in all areas of life. Even on the surface, they seem to be the way of nature, but underneath, they're all miracles. And this is put in a clear way in the Gemara when it says, what's the difference between a Shabbos and a Yom Tov? It says, Shabbos Kviva Kaima. Shabbos is a fixed festival each each end of each week to teach us that everything in the world from the new creation, even though it seems natural, is a hidden miracle. And this applies to all the different all the big miracles. And even applies in, in fact that's why we can understand many things concerning the honor to the giving of the mon. The manna was an open miracle. But the purpose of the manna was an open miracle in the desert was to teach the people of Israel, which is explicit in the Chumash, that when you come into Eretz Israel, you should recognize that ordinary bread that you get through plowing and harvesting is a hidden miracle. And the easiest way to understand, the Gemara says, that Shabbos is Kriva Kaima, Yom Tov is so we explained this. This explained already in the Zohar and developed the Bible of Akoel. The word of Shabbos indicates the what's called Itarut de Leila. It's the power that comes from above, 
when we human beings, we people of Israel, are not really on the level. Nevertheless, he gives us something right from above nature, above our nature, in order that we should recognize by turning to God himself, we see that every aspect of our natural life is a hidden miracle. The Yom Tov is a hidden miracle. And because the Yom Tov, how, how do we fix Yom Tov? It's fixed by the Sanhedrin, it's fixed by the people of Israel. It's a reference, it's a root of the Tata. It's when we ourselves, this is the way of Hashem dealing with Amisro and Eretzerah. If we ourselves, we fulfill the will of Hashem, and we immerse ourselves in Torah, Hashem will see to it that all the natural things that happen to us, we realize the hidden miracles. So this is, this is the specific significance of counting. The only way you can, reach, you can reach that level is by working day by day and recognizing it's a daily service we have to do. If we, if we, don't, if we don't enter into our lives a constant daily cheshbon hanefesh, are we really fulfilling the will of Hashem? And are we really dedicating this to Hashem? And thereby we can transform what would otherwise be, be just the way of nature. No, we can make in connection with Hashem. It also supports the principle developed by the Rambam, especially in his modern book, but he mentioned it elsewhere also. He says, how far does the divine providence of Hashem go on human beings? He said, with regard to animals and so on, everything is also divine providence. But it's on a low, low level of the laws of nature. That's how we look at it. The laws of nature apply to the mineral world, the vegetable world, the animal world. But the human beings, which are Hashem Tzilfo, human beings have a divine image, which means that human beings can make a more direct connection with Hashem if they serve Hashem if they count each day of their lives as individuals, and with the land of Israel each year of agricultural and economical efforts that we make, but we recognize that all comes from Hashem. And if that means working day by day. Because if you, keep, if you go one day and the next day not, so backwards and forwards, you, you're likely to be led in your lives by the animalistic nature that is part of the human being. And that will lead you instead of the animistic nature being directed by the Torah. So that's, that, that is the deep concept of the Shabbat entering into our lives. That means Hashem will give us from above the awareness that even those things which seem natural, they're hidden miracles. And if we go along with that, we know therefore also we've got to work each day on getting Shivit Hashem Negdi Tamid. That will bring us to the level when we recognize through our own efforts we're able to connect with Hashem. So at the beginning when Am Yisrael came out of Mitzrayim, they were on the lowest level. They were only really fit for animal fodder. They were on the level of the Soita, for example, because she followed her animistic nature, followed her, 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 her physical desires. And therefore, she has, she's also given a barley offering. Now, Am Yisrael all, all on that level, on the animalistic level. By counting the date, the Shavuot reach the high level. That's the concept of the continuity of the Tzvidat HaOmna, which links up with Tzvidat HaShemitah. And both of them lead to Jubilee, both of them lead to Yoga, which is the highest level. So I'm going to tell you now the following very beautiful calculation, that if you, in order to show you the combination of the Jubilee year, with the giving of the Torah, also called the Yoga, which happened uh, when Amishol were not in the land of Israel at all. It was given in the desert. So the deeper significance like this. Now if you, if you take seven, we took seven is the concept of harmony in nature, which can bring you through nature to an awareness of Hashem. So if you count the days that it's using a natural life <coughs> to recognize the power of Hashem, to build it up. So we have, uh, first we have the Shabbat mentioned in creation after seven days. And then we have, next thing is seven times seven, from Pesach to Shavuot. It's also Shavuot, the end of seven weeks, which is seven 
times seven, seven, seven multiplied by seven. And then if you take the days of the lunar year and you, do, you deduct the number of festivals we have in the year which are above nature, you come to seven times seven times seven, that means seven times, because seven is seven times 50, so you have uh, 350. 350 days in the solar year if you deduct the festivals. Now, then if you, if you multiply the years by seven, that's the Shemitah, which leads you to the Yovel. Then if you multiply the Yovels by seven, then you get 3,500, no, 3,450. Work it out. That's, that's, that is seven times 350 years. That leads you to three, um, that leads you to, what do you call it? That leads you to uh, 303, leads you from 50 years to 345 years. And 345 years is the year when the Torah was given plus another two years. Because it's really, the year when the Torah was given was 3,000, uh, 448. But the extra two years is the reckoning of the years which are referred to in the deeper Midrashim of, of calculations that they're called the years of Tohu. It says at it says, uh, uh, the beginning of creation, the, 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 the date of creation is referred to as the land, that means the globe and its environment, was Tohu And Tohu are two astronomical years that have to do with the, with, the, with the cycles of the planets and the stars that existed two years before the date of creation. So therefore it turns out exactly equivalent to the 2000, um, as we say, the, the 2,450 uh, years in total. So it turns out seven multiplied by seven times, seven days multiplied by seven, seven times, leads it to what? To the day when the Torah was given. So that is the combination of the Jubilee it's interesting, the whole Pasha, the beginning of Baha, uses all these expressions. It says Jubilee, blow the shofar, and the kippah, and the shofar has to go through the whole land. That is the same shofar that was heard on Har Sinai. It was a quote shofar. It was a voice that never stops. The sound of the shofar goes on until the time of the Gola. So now ultimately, there's the phrase, which has been adopted also in America, like we said yesterday on the, on the Philadelphia bell, bell, that the blowing of the shofar, which is really what the bell refers to, it says on that bell you should call freedom to all the inhabitants of the earth, or the inhabitants of the land, you can translate. And that was applied by the American Puritan. They thought we want to build a, a society of freedom. And they put it on the bell. With it, it's all the thing. We didn't quite know what the shofar looks like, so we made a bell. It's interesting in our time, they made a special park here in Shalim, central Shalim, with the bell there also, that same bell. And they call it for freedom. And we really describe how also many societies recognize how social freedom is really developed in all the laws of Schmidt and Yoga, especially the Jubilee year, which have been adopted, as we already explained in many societies, to create a type of limitation on capitalism, to create a socialistic society, which is based upon moral principles to be adopted by citizens, and then you can have <coughs> an avoidance of capitalism, even though you gave private enterprise. <clears throat> so this is the balance created by the Torah.
connecting everything. So from this, <coughs> we come also <coughs> to a deeper understanding of Lagba Omer. Because the origin of Lagba Omer, as already explained, is in the first time that Omer mentioned the Chumash, which is with the falling of the Mosh. And the Mon fell on the 18th of Iyar. The date is mentioned in the, in the Chumash. It says that Ham Yisrael, when they're wandering in the desert, also they're counting the days. So it says, on the 15th, the 14th, 14th, 15th, it says on the 15th of the month of Iyar, that means of the second month, they came in the desert and they had no, no meat and no bread and no water. Of course, they complained very much. And then three days later, on the 15th, the moon fell. And also at night, the quails fell. They were given meat, they were given moon in a miracle, above nature. That's what it says the Omer. Because the Omer represents, also represents, as we explained, it, it, it we do, the Omer was a measure, enough for a person's meal for a day. For a family. And each one's given the same. And if they, if they went, became greedy and took more, and brought it and so on, all the descriptions of the Omer. And it says in the Bible, the purpose of the Omer is to teach us that man does not live by bread alone, he lives on that which comes out from the mouth of Hashem. In other words, the bread also. The bread in the Mon, which was Lechem and Shemayim, even they said the Brocha, bread from heaven, was to teach us the daily bread you're going to have in Yitzhak Hashem. When you go to Eretz Israel, it won't be heavenly bread. No, it'll be earthly bread. We should recognize that earthly bread also comes from Hashem. And your attitude to it should be all the laws you can learn out from the Omer itself. In other words, and the, and what they called it, they, they called it Mon because they didn't know what it was. Kiloed of Mahu. It's already explained. So it should be called Ma. Why was it called Mon? Because Mon comes from the roots, a portion. Everybody should be happy with the portion that Hashem has given him in the natural life and should connect with Hashem by saying blessings on it, by thanking Hashem for what He gives us. And if you put your trust in Hashem at the highest level, you'll see Hashem will look after you in one way or another. And don't start complaining that if I don't have enough, Hashem will help you. As long as you follow the way of the Torah. And the more you follow the way of the Torah, the more you see that Hashem will help you. So it's very interesting. This is the real origin of Lag Boma. Because it turns out, when did the mon, the field, mon, the mon fall? It fell on Lag Boma. So Lag Boma preceded Shimp and Yochoi for thousands of years. So it's much, much. And by the way, this, this is very interesting. This interpretation is adopted also by the Chasm Soifa, who was an opponent of people burning their clothes. He used to do Magmon Lag Boma. He didn't like the point, he didn't think the bonfires were justified, they could create accidents and so on. And he, but he said, La Boma is the most holy day, because that's the day of the Mon. And the greatest, of, we can even say, the greatest of Shimpon Choy was that he was on the level of the Oichle Hamon, because the sages say the Oichle Hamon is given to those whose whole life is dedicated to Torah. They are the ones who have the how could taste all the beauty in the mon? While the wicked people tasted the mon, they said afterwards, it, 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 after a certain time, they said, we're sick of this bread. They said, you can't be complaining. Because it's the concept lies behind it. People will come, if people themselves, they, they are people of bitterness, they, they don't act with chesed, and they don't, are not close enough to Hashem, so they always complain. Whatever they've got, they'll complain. Don't have enough. We've got, we've got to learn the lessons of the mon. People do learn the lessons of the mon in all their lives. They keep Shabbos. Somebody how do you help me keep Shabbos? And many people of the day also. There's some people, the faith, our business will collapse. No, we're going to keep Shabbos completely. That's why they complain. 
but um, the people in, all over the world, the people really want to keep the Torah, but they say, well, my business, I'm, 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 I have to go to the markets, and the market day is on, on Shabbos, so what should I do? The answer is, try hard to put your trust in Hashem. For example, I was, I was in a city where, of course, there were rich people and so on who could afford the different higher professions, they didn't have any problems with Shabbos. But many people who were workers had worked very hard and they, and they, they went to the market. In fact, with the, the shul that was there, they had a special early Shabbos minion, which was mainly attended by, by people who went to the market afterwards, the business. And people had to say, people in England, they thought, for well, someone who's died, they have to say college. We had in that minion, when I came to Manchester, we had the, very interesting, we had, we had that main shul. The main shul service starts at nine o'clock. So I had there some uh, the people who were the tzaddikim of the shul from the early generation. Some of them already, one of them still had a blessing from his Lord Salanta. So we had a million of people who kept the Shabbos. But people didn't keep the Shabbos, about 200 at the beginning, about 200 people from all over Manchester who came to this Ashkoma Minion in the Beta Medrash of the Central Shul, which helped the bar. And when I came there, we you know we had we had I tried to get the all the kid reorganized. And there were some people who said, you know, if you look, if you will look in the morning, go to that go to that minion, because that's an early minion, I would like to go to that minion, because there was there was a minion of Shemli Shabbos, but there were about twenty million on him of Mahalle Shabbos. And they told me, look around the corner where they parked their cars, around the corner, in the hiding. They came inside, the Kaddish says. And there are many people, the humans say, you know, you've got to abolish that minion. So it isn't, I had, I talked it all over. My Rebbe then was the Minchas Yitzchok, who afterwards became the chief rabbi of the Eda Haredes here, a fantastic saint and scholar, biggest poskim in the world. But he, he was the rabbi of the general Kehila, the Arbet so I discussed it with him and I said, listen, I'd I, I like to go to that minion because it, it, it's before the, they get in the whole Kriyashima beforehand. And this, you know, this, the later minion we had to say to Russia where there was a, the, there was a chazan, well, what, we had word in our chazanim. Okay, so any of the old, old generation, they liked to go to the early minion, they went home for breakfast, then he came over to listen to the drosha of the chazan. More the, more the, more the chazan, the drosha. So there's no discussion. So I said, let me try. I'm going to try to go to the every Shabbat. And every Shabbat I will speak about the importance of keeping Shabbat. So he used to speak every Shabbat in that shul at Davide also. And then I gave a talk on how you can recognize Shabbos to be the source of blessing. And what happened? A few of them worked together. There was also a member of the shul who was a strong market man, and he managed to get arrangements that he could make a good living by going to retailers in the week to work all out, even the market. I brought him also to speak and to encourage them. And then out some of them I said, Maybe you should change your profession. And the truth is, I'm to change their profession. And they made a better living, the new profession, where they didn't have to keep to be Mechal Shabbos than the previous one. And so, and so it demonstrated how Shabbos can be the source of blessing. That, that, that is something that, let's say here, the state of Israel, when he came, there was Shavitot constantly leading to a big deficit for the LR Airlines. LR Airlines did not keep Shabbos. They, because they, they thought they needed to compete with others. And non-stop, there were constant strikes, should we talk? So, oh Hashem, there was a campaign made when when a more religious prime minister came in and some of the, even some Haredi ministers went to the government. They managed to bring about uh, change uh, to, to keep Shabbos in Elal, 
As a result, many from people wouldn't go on their own. They joined, and they were supported by the government. And then, Baruch Hashem, in fact, in that year, we published a magazine, and El Al gave us an advert, Vayishpot Bayom Ashri'i, together with nice, nice photographs of El Al. And Baruch Hashem, for many years, there was no Shvitov in El Al. And they didn't make a deficit. So you see, Shabbos could be the source of blessing. It's like we have, but like we spoke about Shmita also. It's the same principle that carried on until today. Now, you have any questions before, before we go on with what the, you have to understand more about the whole of love for Amen, the counting of the Amen. Any, any questions? So, you, you can take the sheets now, you've got them, and you look in the second column, this is a, an insight into the whole concept of the Shemitah, as well as counting the Shemitah and counting the Omer. The question which is asked at the beginning of last week's Pasha is why specifically by Shemitah and Yovel it says these were given on Harsinai. So Rashi says, Mein Shemitah Harsinai, Ma Shemitah Nemru, Kodik to Keho, to Harsinai of Kulat. Just like Shemitah, we have such a thorough description of all the laws in the Pasha's Baha, because there's Shemitah and Yovel. So we say it was given to Sinai. Well, and why is that particularly given to Sinai? Because one should think at Sinai they would only give laws that apply at that time. No, Sinai was given the laws that apply for all times. When you inherit this world, which will come much later. But he says here, in must get it's the mitzvah here. Look some more, Kolka. He said, why is, it, why is it more an extreme example than any other mitzvah? doesn't understand the answer either. What does Shmita teach us about the whole Torah? This is given a scene there. So he said, to understand more deeply, there's a principle mentioned in the Gemara, that many of the general principles of the Mitzvahs in detail, which are given in Sinai, were repeated again to the next generation on the plains of Moab, on the threshold of Eretz Israel. Because and when the Torah was given, the people were given the mission to become a kingdom of priests. As it says, in the future, Atem Kohane Hashem, you'll be called in Israel, you are priests of God. <coughs> At that time, in the future, all Israel will be servants of Hashem. And then it says, Ani Amati, Elohim Atem, Shalem Hashem. I even said, you reach such a high level that the angel of death will not have power over you. So that means really when they received the Torah, there was preparation for the people of Israel to reach the level of Adam before the sin. Because Adam, Adam is Adam, so the human species, were created to serve the Creator and should not really be involved in the physical world. What's described in First parshas, the Chumash is, if, if from a deep angle, a spiritual life. Although it's described in more physical terms, or it could be that, let's put it this way, it's that concept of resurrection of the dead. When there'll be Tchiyatamitim, future life, it means there's a certain physical aspect, 
but it ruled entirely by the spiritual dimension, by the Tzelem Elohim. And that existed in Adam Rishon, Gan Eden. And this was the future life of Gan Eden. So we see that if what happened when Moshe Rabbeinu led the people 40 years, they had the mount. Well, on this Torah, it was a mount. The Torah was really given to those who eat mount. <coughs> that means, Heilehem Amal Rachel They did have to use physical effort to gather in the mount. And even this, there were different levels. The study came for the saints. The mount came at the entrance to their homes. Bainonim, the intermediate group amongst Amisrael, that the gods are collected. The wicked ones short of a lot to. They had to go a long way to pick it up. Someone who didn't have much faith, he had to toil much more. So actually it depends on his level of saintliness. So everyone had a little bit of work to do, but for the saints it was just outside their door. And if Moshe Rabbeinu would have come to Eretz Israel, then this would have remained the state forever. But Hashem saw that the generation not fit for this. They're not yet on the level of the resurrection of the dead and redemption. So therefore, the second generation, threshold of Eretz Israel, on the plains of Moab, before they went to Eretz Israel, there, then, then the Torah was not on the Madrega Moshe Rabbeinu, was not kept by the people on that Madrega. It became the Chet of Yeshua. There was a different type of Hoyles Hashem under Yeshua. And Yeshua, it was not on the level that all the people of Tzadikim. Then began Kol Echad Lavor. Everybody then began to work in their fields. And one in his field, one in his vineyard, and that's the beginning of Mishneh Torah. Mishneh Torah is the Torah as it to be applied in Eretz Israel, not on the Madriga of Adam Rishon for the sin. I mean, they sinned, but still, even on that low Madriga, they could still reach a very high level. And he says, beginning of the Varen, that Moshe Rabbeinu gave the over the Torah by Er Heteib, explained very clearly. In other words, it was explained clearly, it was even translated into all the languages. The Gemara says, Moshe mi And then the words in the Sefer the are also words of Torah, but they're not on the same level as the words of Torah in the previous books. That's why we find in that sense the Ten Commandments, the Ten Saints, this difference between Dibrot Rishonot and Zachor. Zachor means you will remember and you never forget. It says the words of the Charut Alaruchot, the words of the Decalogue, were engraved upon the tablets of stone, which were miraculous. In Mole, Lulish Tabru, Luchot Rishonot, if those first tablets will not be broken because of the sin of the golden calf. No, the Torah will never become forgotten. The Torah will remain on a very high level. The level of Moshe Rabbeinu. And that way Moshe Rabbeinu is Moshiach. And the Guru would have come right away. Or the Tibro But the second Tibro, which are put on the second Luchot, they were given after the people had reached the lower level and seen with the golden calf. Then says Shamor. Shamor means Shemir has to make sure to preserve it. It can become forgotten. And therefore, it's not like Zachor. Zachor you, means you will remember. In any case, you remember the Torah. Whatever was given, you remember forever. But people went down and therefore forgetfulness came in. So we say, Lucha the Rishonot, Luai El Aser, the Tadib of the Bar. By the first Lucha, there were only the Aser of Tadib of Lucha Shriot, 
אני נותן לך שהם בהם מדרש והגדול. But by the second luchot, I'll have to give you a lot of oral teachings. You'll need all the oral teachings. In order that you should be able to apply more heavenly Torah to the earthly situations where there is forgetfulness. Chitza Nitzrach HaRav Chochma Letaken HaRav Kaz Because you've got to have a multitude of wisdom which goes through the intellect because you're no longer on the level, because of the Cheta Ego, that you have intuitive, direct communication with the high words of Torah Shebechtar. So this is a deep concept, that this high level of remembrance, that you don't forget things, is because your mind reflects the mind of Hashem. Through your essence of your real existence is with the Torah. Like Moshe Rabbeinu, Kurbein, three times it was 40 days without food, a drink, without sleep, on the mountain. Because he, and he still, he still had a body. So the meeting, the Tepai Tari had a body, was sanctified at the highest level. So it says even, if Amishra would have said, they'd only need the Chumash, and also the book would be sure to know how to divide the land. You wouldn't need any further Musa. From the, from the prophets. Unfortunately, we sin, and therefore, we've got to also have the Torah Shabbat Peh and the Nevi'im to show us the right path. So, so, so perhaps uh, before the Shia tomorrow, you'll ask any, any comments or questions.